This is section 4.1, estimation with confidence intervals. So you have your learning objectives here, and then the comic doesn't actually have to do with confidence intervals, but I do want to point this out because it's saying that assumptions do lie. And the problem is in statistics, we're always working with underlying assumptions. Okay, we're assuming that people found random samples. We're assuming that they asked good questions. We're assuming that they designed their experiment well. And if those assumptions are wrong, then every result we get from statistics is going to be wrong. So statistics are only as good as the assumptions that we make and hoping those assumptions are true. So now let's review just a little bit from our previous chapters. Okay, so we have statistics versus parameters. So your parameter is a number that summarizes something in your population. So if you have categorical data, then your parameter is going to be that long run probability or a population proportion pi. And if you're quantitative, then it's your long run mean or like your population mean mu. Okay, so pi is for categorical, mu is for the quantitative, for the mean. Now, whether you're categorical or quantitative, you also have your statistics. So your statistic is the number that summarizes your sample data. So if we have categorical, it's going to be our sample proportion, p hat. And if we're quantitative, it's going to be our sample mean, x bar. So like x bar is our sample mean, whereas mu is going to be our population mean. So then once we know what our sample statistics are going to be, whether it's going to be a sample proportion or a sample mean, then we can look at the sampling distribution of all of our possible sample statistics. So if we have categorical data, then if we look at the sampling distribution for all those possible sample proportions, the center of it or the mean of all those different sample proportions we have is just going to be centered at our population proportion, pi. And the standard deviation of the sampling distribution, or the standard deviation of all the p hats, so the standard deviation of the various p hats is going to be equal to the square root of pi times 1 minus pi over n. Now, we've been writing it out in words. You'll notice in this textbook, with every section, we try and give you just a little bit more detail. So we've been calling it the standard deviation p hats. Now we'll have this new notation called SD of p hats. just means standard deviation of all the p hats. And the shape of the sampling distribution will be normal if we have at least 10 successes and at least 10 failures, if our sample size is big enough. If it's quantitative, then the mean or center of all the possible sample means is mu, our population mean. And the standard deviation of all the x bars or all the sample means is just sigma, our population standard deviation over the square root of n. So I didn't write that up here. We should probably add this. So our sample standard deviation is s and our population standard deviation is sigma so those are our notations for those so sigma is our population standard deviation so we'll do sigma over square root of n that's the standard deviation of all of our different sample means or if we're going to estimate it we change it to now say it's the standard error and we do s over the square root of n and we know that our shape will be normal. The shape of all the possible sample means is normal if the population is normal or the sample size is large enough. And really, that depends on what your population looks like. Usually you said a sample size of at least 30. It's going to be good for anything. And then for our hypothesis test, we also looked at our standardized statistic. So our standardized statistic is going to be our statistic minus our mean of our null distribution over standard deviation of the null distribution. So it turns out, if you're going to look at categorical data, okay, then our statistic for categorical is just going to be our sample proportion, p hat, minus, well, the mean of the null distribution, we just said the mean of the null distribution should be pi. So we'll put our hypothesized pi, since we don't really know what pi is, we're doing a test to see, so it's our hypothesized pi, over the standard deviation of p hat, the standard deviation of all of those possible sample proportions. And so you'll just see various levels of these formulas as we go throughout the textbook of them just adding more and more notation each time, but it's the same formula. If it's quantitative, if you're doing means, instead of a Z statistic, you have a T, because we have to use that for means because we're estimating. We don't know our population standard deviation. We have to estimate it with our sample standard deviation. So we have this like standard error. Okay. And so once we have to do that, we use the T distribution. So we'll say T equals, we'll do our sample means minus our hypothesized population mean over the standard deviation of X bar. Whether you happen to know sigma or you happen to know s, like either way, it's just going to be that standard deviation over the square root of n. Okay, today we're going to talk about significance level. So when we do a test of significance, we use the rule that 
we said if our p-value is big, if it's bigger than 0.05, or if our standardized statistic is from negative 2 is less than t is less than 2. Okay, then we said our null is plausible. So I have this little graph down here. You can see we have standardized statistics here. So if we're from negative 2 to 2, if we're in the middle, that means the null is plausible. Also, if we're in the middle, that means our p-value is going to be big. Okay. So that means your null is plausible. You have no evidence for the alternative. But if your p-value is small, less than 0.05, or your standard statistic is out here in the tails, like so if you're out here in the tails, this tail or that tail, so you're farther than two away, that means the null is not plausible. That means you have evidence for the alternative. So the question is, why do we use those values of 0.05 as a cutoff for the p-value and 2 as a cutoff for the significance level? Well, if you recall from previous chapters, <coughs> The empirical rule says if we have a symmetric data set that looks like a normal curve, then about 68% of the observations are within one standard deviation of the average. And 95% of our observations are within, oops, that is supposed to say, two standard deviations of the average. And about 99.7% of the observations are within three standard deviations of the average. So I have this graphic. If you have the average here, if you got one standard deviation in either direction, that's 68% of your data. If you got two standard deviations, that's 95% of your data. If you've got three standard deviations, that's 99.7% of your data. So when we look at a sampling distribution of possible sample proportions, or possible sample means, we know that about 95% of our possible sample proportions should be within two standard deviations of the population parameter. Because if we're looking at sample proportions, we'd be centered at pi, the population parameter, if we got two standard deviations, that should be about 95% of all of our values of p hat. And we decided before that something is not plausible if our data would happen less than 5% of the time. So 5% of the time in the tails lines up with two standard deviations. So that lines up with like two as your standardized statistic. So this would be like z equals two, and this would be z equals negative two for our standardized statistics. But what if we wanted to use a different cutoff for our p-value in 0.05? So your significance level is what we call the cutoff for how small our p-value needs to be to reject the null hypothesis. So we've been using 0.05 for this entire class so far, but there are other possible significance levels you could do. So you could do 0.10 for like some social studies, journals, things where they're not so concerned, and also your data is really messy. It's hard to get a really small p-value. Um, 0.05 works for almost everything you're going to do. But some medical journals, or like aviation journals, engineering, et cetera, they might be even stricter, and they might use a p-value cutoff of 0.01. So by default, we're always going to use like 0.05 unless it tells us otherwise, because some journals will want us to be a little bit more strict and use that 0.01 level. So we've learned how to do hypothesis tests. We want to test a claimed value as a population parameter. At the end of the test, all we can say is if our claimed value is plausible or if we have evidence against that value. But we often want to estimate what the population parameter actually is. So we're going to use what's called confidence intervals. So let's go back to our kissing example. We did this once before. Tic Tacs claimed that 74% of people tilt their head to the right when they kiss. Gunturkin didn't believe that 74% was accurate, so he observed kissing couples in public to see which way they turned their heads. So he observed 80 out of 124 pairs that turned their head to the right, or he got a sample proportion, p hat, of 0.645. So if you go back to your notes on that page, we said the null hypothesis would be the 0.74, that was the claim. His alternative is he thinks that's wrong. He didn't know if he thought it should be less than or greater than, so we just did a not equals to because we didn't know which way it should go. And we did a one proportion z test, or we did a proportion test. And we got a theory-based p-value of 0.0159. So based on that p-value, what would be your conclusion? So I would say that's a small p-value. It's less than 0.05. So that means the null is not plausible. And that means we have evidence that the population proportion is not 0.74. And that's what we did before on the example. But here's the thing. All we can say after doing that significance test is that our population proportion is not 0.74. That's not really very helpful. 
Wouldn't you rather be able to say what the population proportion pi is, or at least be able to give a range of plausible values for pi? And so this is where we do confidence intervals. So to continue this example, we're pretty sure that our population proportion pi is not 0.74. So let's test some other values of pi to see what a plausible value might be. And so what I've done is I pull up the applet, and I'm going, I can go to the theory-based inference calculator, or I can do the one proportion with the simulation, since we're doing theory-based p-values. Actually, I forgot, I want to do the other one. We can use either one, but this one does have a nice feature. Okay, so let's see. We claimed that our population proportion was 0.74. It says he looked at 124 people. Uh, we don't need to change the number of samples because we're going to use the theory base, but I can if I want. And let's see, he had how many successes? 80 successes. We can count that. And we can click our normal approximation. Oh, and I almost forgot we need to click our two-sided. So if our population proportion is 0.74, the chance to get... Let's change this to proportional successes. The chance to get a sample proportion of 0.6452 or something farther away is only 0.0161. Okay, that's a small p-value. Like, okay, that didn't work. Sorry, I just rounded differently here than when I did it before. That's why my p-value is not exactly the same. Okay, we're like, okay, we don't think we get this data if our population proportion is 0.74. We said we have evidence that it's not 0.74. So what we're going to do is now I say, okay, well, let's have some other possible values. What if my possible value of pi is 0.5? So I can come back here and I can say, well, what if my population proportion is 0.5? And now hit enter. Now what is my p-value? So now my p-value is 0.0012. Okay, so is 0.5 a plausible value? Well, that's a small p-value. So 0.5 is not plausible. Okay. What about 0.6 though? If I want to put in 0.6, now I get a p-value of 0.3042. Again, I just rounded differently, so these are slightly different values. Um, that's a pretty big p-value, right? So is 0.6 a plausible value? Yes, big p-values means that that's a plausible value. What about 0.7? Now my p-value is 0 0.8130. That's a big p-value. That seems plausible. And if I want to try a possible value of 0.8, I can draw my samples. Looks like my p-value is 0. So is 0.8 plausible? Definitely not. That is a very small p-value. So now to come back to our notes, We did four different hypothesis tests for four different possible values of pi. We got di four different p-values, and we decided if that value of pi was plausible or not. So after we've done that, what are some possible values? Well, we could say that 0.6 and 0.7 are plausible. Okay, so we're doing a little bit better. We can say 0.74 is not plausible, but 0.6 and 0.7 are plausible, so we have a little bit more useful information. But what if we want to fine-tune our results even more? So remember, we're going to say a claimed value of pi is plausible if our p-value is greater than 0.05 or our standardized statistic is from negative 2 to 2. So really, we're looking for values that are in that middle of the curve. That's how we know that pi is plausible. So we have to go through. I put in, I went by increments of 0.01. So every value from 0.5 all the way to 0.8, uh, going by increments of 0.1 for all the possible values of pi. And I went ahead and found the theory-based p-values and standardized statistics for you for most of them because otherwise this is going to take us a really long time. Okay. But this is one way that you can find confidence intervals. Luckily, it's not the only way you can find confidence intervals. We're going to teach you another way later, but this one helps us develop our logic. So again, if I put in 0.5 and I draw my samples, I'm going to change this to 0.645 is, I think how I rounded it before, just so that everything matches up. So when I put in 
0.5 as my hypothesized value. I hit enter. Okay. And now my p-value is 0 0.0012. And my standardized statistic z is 3.23. Okay, that's a small p-value. My standardized statistic is big, it's out in the tails. So that is not a plausible value. So let's try 0.51. So now I can tell you that my p-value is 0 0.0026. And my standardized statistic is 3.01. So again, that's a small p-value. 3.01 is a standardized statistic. That's far out in the tails. So that value is not plausible. And I just keep doing this each time, 0.52, enter. So it looks like my p-value is 0 0.0053, and my standardized statistic is 2.79. So still small p-value, still far on the tails, so not plausible. Now here's one of the things I wanted to show you on this applet. I can keep hitting them in individually, okay? or I can click on these show sliders, and I can change the success of the probability of pi. So I'm at 0.52. If I click on this, I can drag this to like point. Sorry, it won't work with my mouse. I can drag it. So, okay, I'm at 0 0.52, 0 0.53. Doesn't always work super well. Sometimes you can use your arrow key to fine tune it. So when I'm at 0 0.53 as my possible probability of success, then my p-value is point. 0103 and my standardized statistic is 2.57 so that's still a small p-value smaller than 0 0.05 I'm still out there in the tails with my standardized statistics so not plausible okay. coming back over here I can change my probability of success to 0 0.54 and so now my p-value is 0 0.0190 my standardized statistic is 2.35 and it's still not possible. But this is nice because I can just kind of drag it along. So what about 0.55? Oh, my p-value you can see is getting a little bit bigger. If I drag it out, like my p-value is getting bigger, and you can kind of drag it along and see what happens. Not that you have to, you can just list everything out like this. So those are some of our p-values in standardized statistics. And then we can just go through, so like at 0.55, we're at 0 0.035, that's still a small p-value. 2.13, that's still out in the tail, so that one is still not plausible. Okay, what about a p-value of 0.0565, though? That's bigger than 0 0.05. And 1.91, oh, we're no longer out in the tails. So this one is plausible, and I can just go through quickly. Big p-value, big, 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 big. So all of these are yes. Okay, all of those are big p-values. Let's see, big p-value. Standardized statistic, that's not out in the tails. So that value is plausible. Let's see, big p-value, big, 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 big. What about this one? 0.069, that's still technically big p-value. So all of these are yeses. But right here, 0.033, that's a small p-value. 2.13, that's out far in the tails. So this one is no longer plausible. And then it, we just get smaller and smaller and smaller for our p-value. So all of these are going to be no. So you have to do that for lots of different possible values of pi. Definitely is going to take a really long time, not a fun way to do it. I will say on the homework, I went through and I put in a lot of the different p-values for you just to save you time, so you only have to find a couple by hand for each problem. Okay, so now that we've done all this, what are some possible plausible values of pi? Well, let's see. Let me erase the circles that we already have so we don't confuse ourselves. What are the ones where we said yes? We said yes for everything from here. Those all had yeses. What else was yes? Everything here. So I could say pi is plausible. And instead of writing all those numbers, I could say from 0.56 to 0.72. So anything between 0.56 and 0.72 is a plausible value of pi. And what significance level were we using? We used the cutoff of 0.05. So 
So there was a 0.05, or like 5%, if you want to do it as a percentage, significance level that we used to decide whether there was enough evidence against the hypothesized value. Notice that 95% and 5% add up to give 100%. So 95% is what we call our confidence level, and it's a measure of how confident we are about our interval estimate of the parameter. So we can call our interval of plausible values we just found a 95% confidence interval for pi. And so what we do is we write an interpretation like this. We say we are 95% confident. The 95% confidence comes when we had like 5% as our cutoff. That the population proportion of all couples, so this means population proportion, or the word all tells you it's for that population. The population proportion and every confidence interval interpretation you do should always be focused on the population proportion. Who lean their heads to the right while kissing is in the interval, what did we say it was? 0.56 to 0.72. That's our confidence interval that we found. So that's called a 95% confidence interval. We're pretty sure that those are all the different plausible values of pi. Pi, we don't know what our population proportion is, but we're pretty sure it's somewhere in that interval. So, how will you interpret your confidence intervals? If we find a 95% confidence interval is 0.56 to 0.72, what that means is any value from 0.56 to 0.72 is a plausible value for pi. Or you can say that we're 95% confident that pi is between 0.56 to 0.72. Now, again, our interpretation of a confidence interval is always about the population parameter. It should always talk about the population proportion or a long run probability. It should never talk about our sample other samples, observational units, that, that means the individual values, it should always be about the population proportion. So, for example, for our kissing data, the interval is 0.56 to 0.72. If, it might have been a long time since you were in a math class to use this notation. This is just how we write confidence intervals if we want to use mathematical notation. It just means it's an interval between 0.56 to 0.72. So if we want to interpret it, let's see which one is correct. This one says we are 95% confident of the long run proportion. So that sounds right, like that's saying our population proportion. It says all people, that also sounds good, that turn their head to the right is between 0.56 to 0.72. Okay, so that one sounds true. Okay. Let's see in the next one. If we were to collect another sample of 124 kissing pairs, there's a 95% probability that the sample proportion would be between 0.56 to 0.72. So this one says sample proportion. It can't say sample proportion. It shouldn't be talking about our sample. It should only talk about our population proportion. So this one is false. See, so number three, we're 95% confident that the proportion of the 124 kissing pairs. Oh, there's a problem. When it says 124 kissing pairs, that was our sample. So that's going to be false. It should never talk about your sample. Next one, we are 95% confident that a randomly chosen kissing pair, a randomly chosen kissing pair, would have a probability of turning their head to the right between 0.56 and 0.72. That sounds like an individual. Not the population proportion sounds like an individual. So that would be false. This might seem like a little thing, but you'll find a lot of questions on your homework and the tests are based on interpreting confidence intervals. Because in real life, computers will find the confidence interval for you. You have to be able to interpret it. That's what the computer doesn't do. Okay. There are other confidence levels you can do. So we just learned about different significance levels. We said you can have like a 0 0.10 significance level, 0 0.05 or 0.01. So 0 0.10 as a significance level, that's 10%. So it would correspond to a 90% confidence level. 0 0.05, that's 5%. So that corresponds to a... 95%. So this is 10%, 5%, and 0.01, that's 1%. So that's going to correspond with a 99% confidence level. So for example, let's find a 99% confidence level for the kissing data. So that just means our cutoff. Well, if we want 99%, our cutoff is going to be 1% or 0.01, because you just subtract it from 100. So I've gone through for you, and these are all the p-values we found previously. I just filled them in here, and we just decided it's a plausible at a 0.01 cutoff level. So we're going to look 0.001, oh, that's smaller than our cutoff, so not plausible. 
0.026, that's still smaller than our cutoff. So no, 0.05, that's still small. What about this one though? 0.0103, that's bigger than a cutoff of 0.01. So is it plausible? Yes. And then 0 0.019, 0 0.03, 0 0.05, all of these are just getting bigger. So all of these are just going to be, yes, they're all going to be big p-values. Let's see, checking over here, 0.7244, that's still a big p-value. It's bigger than 0 0.01, so it is still plausible. Let's see, big, 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 0 0.06, we're getting smaller, but we're still bigger than 0 0.01. 0 0.03, that's still big. 0 0.0159, that's still bigger than 0 0.01, so we're still plausible, so we'll say yes for all of those. What about 0 0.0069 though? That's now smaller than our cutoff, so it is no longer plausible, and then just gets smaller and smaller, so none of those are plausible. So what are our plausible values? Or plausible at 0 0.01 cutoff? What's plausible? We said the first plausible one is at 0.53. And let's see, where is our next one? The last plausible value was 0.74. So we can say something like, we are 99% confident that what? That the population proportion is between 0.53 to 0.74. You'll notice that this is a wider confidence interval than we had before. Before we were at 0.56 to 0.72. This is wider. We went farther out. And the reason why is to be more confident, you just make your interval wider. Then you can be more confident that you found the true value. So that means we don't know for sure what our population proportion is, but we're 99% confident it's between those two numbers. Okay. Well, what if we want to find a 90% confidence level for the kissing data? For 90%, well, that means your cutoff is at 10% or 0.10. So as I go through it, I'm just going to look for what's the value, or look at every p-value to see if it's bigger or less than 0.10. So it looks like my cutoff is right here. So 0.145, that's bigger. This one would be plausible. So plausible at a 0.10 level. But 0.09, that's smaller, so it would be no. So all of these are no. And then all of these p-values would be big. 0.724, that's still big, so that's still plausible. But then my p-values get smaller and smaller. Well, let's see, what about here? 0.1107, that's still bigger, so that's still a yes. But what about 0.069? Now that's a small p-value at a 0.10 level, so it is no longer plausible, and then it just keeps getting smaller and smaller. So we would say it's plausible at a 0.10 cutoff. What are our values? So we're plausible at 0.58. Do, 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 to the next one that's plausible is 0.11. Sorry, that's my p value. Um, 0.1107, that's 0.71 as a value of our population proportion. So those are all of our plausible values at a 0 0.10 cutoff. So we're 90% 90, 90 confident that. The population is between 0 0.58 to 0 0.71. Okay, so next, test of significance versus confidence intervals. So it turns out confidence intervals are so closely linked to tests of significance that we can use confidence intervals to do our tests of significance and vice versa. So if a hypothesized parameter is in our confidence interval, then that means our possible value is plausible. That means that your p-value is big. There's no evidence for the alternative. But if a hypothesized parameter is not in our confidence interval, then the hypothesized value is not plausible. That means your p-value would have to be small, and there's evidence for the alternative. Now, this is all just based on what we've been doing. But instead of saying, let's test every single value, we're like, oh, I could just look at like 0.55. If it's in the interval, oh, it's not in the interval, I can tell you it was a small p-value. Or if I want to test like 0.069 here, I can say, okay, 
well, 0.69 is in the interval. That means it must have had a big p-value, which it did. It was at 0.2786. Okay, um, I had a typo, so I'm restarting the video to this point. That's why some of the work is already here. Okay. So example 122, suppose the machine is used to fill bags with coffee and each bag is one kilogram. A randomly selected sample of 30 bags has a mean weight of 1.01 kilograms and a standard deviation of, this is the thing I changed, of 0.025 kilograms. Perform a two-tailed test for the significance level of 0.01 and decide if the machine needs to be adjusted. So let's go through and first write down the information they told me. So a sample size of 30, I'd write that down as n equals 30. We have a, our sample has a mean weight of 1.01, .01, so my sample mean equals 1.01, .01, and my sample standard deviation is 0.025. Okay, we want to do a two-tailed test. We're going to use a cutoff level 0.01 and decide if the machine needs to be adjusted. Okay, our null hypothesis would be that our machine is working. Okay, it's always status quo, nothing interesting. That means like your population average is one kilogram. If I want to use symbols, I could say H with a zero, and I'd say my population mean mu equals one kilogram. And the alternative then is that the machine needs to be fixed, it needs to be adjusted. My population mean is not one kilogram, and its symbols would be the H with the A. So my population mean mu is not equal to one kilogram. We haven't said if we think it's under or if we think it's over. Either way, we're going to have issues, right? We just want to see if it's different from that. Um, can we use a theory-based approach? Well, for sample means, you either need to have a normal population or a sample size of at least 20 and some metric data, or a sample size of 30 will work for any shape of data. We have a sample size of 30, so we're good to go. So if you go to the next page, I wrote down all the information again for us, just so that we could see it to keep working. So what we're going to do is we're going to go to the theory-based applet to actually find a p-value. So we'll use our theory-based applet. And I come in and I have to change the scenario to one mean. I put in my sample size of 30, a mean of 1.01, .01, a sample standard deviation of 0.025. Okay. You have to click on test of significance. You have to say that my population mean mu equals one. That's what you want to compare it to because it always just starts at zero. And you just click this button until you get to a not equals two. You'll see the mean and SD. Those are the mean and SD of the possible sample means, the sampling distribution. And let's see, it tells you a standardized statistic is 2.19. So if I know that T equals 2.19, and here's my levels, or my cutoffs are negative 2 and 2 for our standardized statistic. So 2.19 would be out here in the tails. So I could say not plausible, at least at a 0.05 level, because 2 and negative 2 corresponds to that 0.05 level. And our p-value right here is 0 0.0366. So now I can tell you my p-value is 0.0366. So let's do a conclusion at 0.05 and 0.01 just for practice, even though it said do it at a 0.01 level. So for a 0.05 level, 0.0366, that is smaller. So this is a small p-value. So I would say my null is not plausible. And we have evidence that the population mean is not one kilogram. But what if we wanted to do a 0.01 cutoff level? Well, if you compare 0.0366 to 0.01, then now it becomes a big p-value. Okay, so that means our null is plausible. Okay, and that means we have no evidence that the population mean is not one kilogram. I know it seems like a double negative, but remember in hypothesis tests, we always write our interpretation in terms of the alternative because that's what we were hoping to show. So in other words, we have no evidence that the machine needs to be fixed. This is one reason why people would use a different significance level is if you think about it, if you're in a factory to shut down the machine to fix it, it's going to be costing you sometimes thousands of dollars an hour. 
Okay. So you don't really want to shut it down unless you have a lot of evidence that it's not working. Now let's see. What confidence level would correspond with a 0.01 significance level? Let's see. So if you have a 0.01 significance level, 0.01 is 10%. Sorry, it's not 10%. 0.01 is 1%, so 99% confidence. So with that in mind, now without finding the interval, is one kilogram going to be in the 95% confidence interval? What about the 99% confidence interval? Well, 95% corresponds to 5% cutoff, or 0.05. So come back up to 0.05. Did we say that it was plausible? So at 0.05, my null is not plausible. Okay, so for 95% confidence, we said that one kilogram, one kilogram, we said is not plausible. It had a big p-value. Sorry, it had a small p-value. So if it's not plausible, that means that one kilogram is not in the 95% confidence interval. Because if you remember, our confidence interval is all of our plausible values. So if we know it has a small p-value, if we know that it's not plausible, it's not going to be in the confidence interval. And without finding the interval, would one kilogram be in the 99% confidence interval? So 99% means a 1% cutoff, or 0.01. Okay. So coming up here, the conclusion on the 0.01, it had a big p-value. We said the null is plausible. So at 99%, that means one kilogram is plausible. So that means one kilogram is in the 99% confidence interval. And we haven't shown you how to do this. We won't show you until a future session or section. But you can come in here to the same applet and you can say, I want you to, you just click confidence interval and it will find a 95% confidence interval. And notice when you look at this 95% confidence interval, does that include one? It doesn't include one, not by law, but it does not include the number one. But if I change it to a 99% confidence interval, notice now one is in that confidence interval. That's just what we just said based on the p-values. Okay, and let's pick the correct interpretation of the 95% confidence interval. Okay, let's see. About 95% of the bag's weights will be in the interval. Oh, the bag's weights, that sounds like individual values. We're not supposed to talk about individual values. So that one can't be it. Well, let's see. If we picked lots of samples of bags, we're 95% confident that their average weights. So their samples, this is talking about samples. We're not supposed to talk about samples. We're 95% confident that the long run average is in the interval. So long run average, that's our population average. That's okay. That's the interpretation that we want to have. Okay, let's just keep going though. In 95% of all of the samples, their averages will be in the interval. We're not supposed to talk about samples. Okay, let's see. If we randomly pick another sample, their average will be in the interval. No. Still not supposed to talk about samples. Okay, so it's not going to be that answer. It would have to be C. And finally, a certain school takes a random sample of 100 students and finds that the sample average cost of books is 320 and an SDM of 90. I found the 95% confidence interval for the mean cost of all the students, so that's like our population mean, is 302 to $337. The 99% confidence interval for the mean cost of books for all the students at the school is 296 to 343. So I found the two confidence intervals for you. And now I want you to consider some different hypothesis tests. So if I want to test that my population mean is 305 or different from 305, what can you tell me about the p-value? Well, let's see. Is 305 in these intervals? Maybe we should draw it out. This one. So like 95% goes from 
302.1 to 337.9. And as you get better at this, you don't always have to draw it out, but it can just be helpful. 99% goes from 296.4 to 343.6. Okay, so now let's figure out where does 305 fit in these ranges? Is it in these intervals? So 305, that would be right here. Well, that means 305 is plausible at 95% and it's also plausible at 99%. So it is plausible at a 5% and 1%. Okay. Well, if it's plausible, I think I don't have a lot of room here. So it's plausible. And if it's plausible, that means big p values. So it's bigger. Then, so 95% goes to 5% or 0.05, and 99% goes to 1% or 0.01. Okay, so if it's plausible, that means it's going to be bigger than, it's plausible for both of them, so it's bigger than 5% or 0.05. What about for a value of 300, though? So 300, that would be right about here. So let's see, it's plausible at 99%, but not plausible at 95%. So my p-value, it's plausible, so that means it's bigger than 0.01. Okay, but it's not plausible at the 5% level, so that means it has to be smaller than 0.01. Okay, what about my next one? If I want to test 350, so where 350 fall? 350 would be like somewhere over here, right? So it's not plausible for either one. So that means it's going to be a small p-value, smaller than 0.05, smaller than 0.01, or just smaller than 0.01. So really, it's just kind of a logic thing. Draw it out. If it's in the confidence interval, it's going to have a small p-value. If it's not in the confidence interval, sorry, I think I just said that wrong. In my mind, I'm already going three sentences ahead and I say the wrong thing. So if it's in the interval, it's a big p-value. Let's make ourselves some notes here. So if it's in the interval, that means it is plausible, and plausible means a big p-value. If it's not in the interval, then that means it is not plausible, and not plausible, we're already familiar with that, not plausible means that it is a small p-value. And you'll have problems like this on the homework so that you can practice.